Whenever you find yourself on the side of a majority, it's time to pause and to reflect. So part two on Believe Your Lying Eyes or Not. And we have Johannes Werner here to finish up the second part and his experiences through his great aunt, I think it was, That's and mm -hmm. how the title of Lying Eyes plays in and how being part of a majority, or maybe not, is a good or bad thing, or maybe not. So Johannes, let's do things, let's talk about the big event that happened and how that works back around and comes through the whole story, okay? In other words, you had the, the event that when people had to make a decision to uh, uh, end the war or not end the war in, in terms of the legal authorities. What's the story on that? So, yeah, um, Germans for uh, more than a decade um, were led to believe that they first had to defend themselves and then conquer the rest of the world along the way somehow. And in the end, when the invading armies were crossing the borders of Germany... And the Rhine River. The Rhine River. Now how far was Remagen from, from what we're talking about here? Uh, Remagen was maybe uh, 200 miles from what we were But that was the last bridge that, 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 that was the last bridge that had not fallen. That is the first bridge that uh, that actually General Patton's army was able to cross. Um, so this was the situation of uh, springtime 1945. Most Germans, I would argue, still believed that they could win this thing. Uh, there was a lot of propaganda consistent propaganda about we're developing these miracle weapons uh, we're developing the fighter jet where we already have missiles actually they did have these weapons it just did not function in the, well they had the v2 that went into London. within the dysfunction of of, of disaster they could not make those weapons have any effect have so uh, Germans still believed that they could win somehow. And the official policy of the Nazi government was we're going to fight this to the very end of every German. It's either we're going to win or everybody is going to go down. End of life. All or nothing. If we do not win, we do not deserve to survive. Oh, wow. That was the official policy, the official strategy. Um, this was the moment when Germans, for the first time, most Germans, I'm talking about civil population, was facing a real choice, and it was a really dire choice. Mm -hmm. They're invading armies, what am I going to do? So this was the situation my, my great aunt was, was under in, in spring 1945. Like many millions of Germans at that time. Um, she was a young mother, four children, a pastor's wife in a rural village in southwest Germany in a part called Württemberg. Well, how do you spell that? Oh my god. Wolfenberg? Württemberg. Württemberg. The kingdom of Württemberg. This R is W O W W U umlaut R T T E M B E R G. Okay, Wittenberg. Um, so they belonged to the, her and her husband, the pastor, they belonged to the elite of this small town of Reichenbach, which was a little dot between mid sized cities. What's the largest city nearby? Uh, it's not very far from Stuttgart. Uh -huh. So, um, there we have, the first thing they see is airplanes, enemy airplanes. They fly over high above um, and they bomb the cities nearby, but not the small town. Um, beautiful weather, there's blue skies, the weather is turning warm. Um, 
She's tending, she's tending the garden. Uh, the garden is important because food supplies are becoming scarce and so you grow your own and she did that very well. Uh, she was taking care of her four children and she was tending to her husband's flock, you know. Flock uh, being the church. Uh, yeah, you were talking about the parishioners, you know. Uh, Lutherans, are they? They were Lutherans, yes. And so there was always someone to tend to, someone to be worried about. And the worries began to increase as the foreign armies began to approach. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one incident in which uh, there was artillery fire that destroyed two buildings in that small town and two people were killed in that. And so that was the first time uh, my great aunt was confronted with war directly. Mm -hmm. um, there was a retreating German army. Uh, there were several officers who were lodged in my great aunt's home. But fortunately, they received orders to retreat very early, way before the before an army arrived. Retreat from the village itself? Retreat from the village, go further east. Um, so they did not have any German army when the foreign troops were approaching. Um, my great uncle, that avoided a fight, the pastor. Right? Yeah. I uh, was then, uh, of course, in a situation of what are we going to do? I mean, the official order was we're going to fight this to the end. We are going to defend the village. They did not have any weapons to speak of, but that was still the official order. So he thought it was necessary to talk with the, the party leader in, in the small town. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, the party leader decided it was okay to hang out the white blankets. And so as great aunt said later, um, she found a, an old cheap blanket and that they hung out of the window. And the foreign armies rolled in, you know, the, the tanks rolled in and nothing happened. Um, that is just, you know, how, how random dealt with people's lives mm -hmm. because uh, I just ran across this um, documentary about a small town about 15 minutes away from me where they were. There was an incident um, where Hitler youth, you know, the last resistance, uh, the 15, 16 year olds were commandeered to that village to build anti-tank barricades. Uh, there was this guy, a farmer, a local farmer, um, on a bicycle, um, he saw them do this and he confronted them. And they said, well, we're defending your village and we're going to do this. And he said, you're not. And when they still resisted, he just slapped their leader and told them to go home. And they did not go home. They reported him to the uh, commanding officer. And long story short, um, he, the farmer, and the party leader of the village and the mayor of the village were commandeered before a wartime tribunal. And in a matter of 15 minutes, they were condemned to death. And they were hanged, all three of them in front of the village cemetery and they were left hanging, their bodies were left hanging for several days. Um, so that particular village had anti-tank barricades and because um, the invading armies were finding out about that, they first sent the airplanes which in turn obliterated that small town. Wow, the whole town. So, um, that this is how problem. random dealt with German lives. So they basically, but, the, uh, the U.S. or so the Allied military then gave warning to each community: either you yield or you all die. Yes, Not there so. were flyers, leaflets that were dropped from airplanes. Um, I would argue that pretty much all Germans know knew about the choice right. they were facing, and in 
many cases, people actually decided we're going to save our town and we're going to surrender. And many people took risks and for the first time, I would argue, many people were willing to take risks because it was about their own skin, finally, and not about that of other people. And really, this is the beginning of the relatively small version of their own Holocaust, if you will. So that uh, the I would object to the term Holocaust because okay. this is about war. This is not about the outcome of war, massacring defenseless people. Yes. Okay. That, that's true too. No, of course, that's true. But the people were defenseless, and if the if the town became resistant, they became totally obliterated as well. Uh, were they innocent? They were victims of war. Was the Holocaust a normal victim of war? No, it was not. A totally different organized killing of a people with with no help within a society supposedly civilized. A far different. Thing. But when you were part of the silence that led up to that particular Holocaust, now you were the antithesis of what uh, civility, civility really is. And you can't pretend it anymore. Now you're defeated. It's an interesting aspect of that. Uh, that it means, in terms of Holocaust, probably not accurate. Go ahead with, the, with your story. So, yeah, um, to many Germans, this came as a bad surprise because they wanted to believe in the truth of the propaganda the, the German government was, was spreading because it was convenient. It was just so much more convenient to believe that we're just going to go through it. Go through it and everything is going to be great. So it's kind of comfortable ignorance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's comfortable ignorance. And it was kind of uh, strange because to my great aunt, she had a brother who was still serving in the army in Italy. How come he was serving in the army in Italy when US troops were Coming on German Germany. soil? Um, <laughs> uh, there were relatives who were serving in occupied Denmark and Norway, you know? How is this possible? So. It was confusing to many Germans. How can you be on the Eastern Front and still defending on the Western Front at the same time? What a, a contradiction. And, or in the South and in, the, uh, in France and so forth. Still be there occupying that and, and lose. Why would you be somewhere else and not protect your own home with your own military? And why didn't they bring... I mean, those questions have to, been, have to have caused real argument among the people. We got troops down there, and we're not getting defended here. Mm -hmm. What is this? Was ist los, right? Is mm -hmm. Was ist los? Was ist das? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and the Romagnan Bridge was the, the big impediment to the Allied forces. Had that gone down, it was a very difficult coming across the Rhine, which is a very fast river. Uh, so we're, we're coming to the final part of this. Is there any particular aspect that you want to mention here? 